Good afternoon. Welcome to the latest Anlinger Highlight Seminar of our, of our Highlight Seminar series. Um, this, as usual, I'm going to shamelessly um, advertise the next one, uh, which will be the last one for, for this year. Uh, in two weeks, on April 29th, we're going to welcome Mark Verbrugge from General Motors, who is also going to talk about uh, energy storage from the vehicle perspective, as you can imagine, from General Motors. But today, uh, I'm delighted that we have uh, Ram Manthiram with us, and, um, and he is going to talk to us about energy storage um, from a, a, a more of a grid scale perspective. Um, and in order to do a proper introduction, I, I will introduce uh, my colleague, Craig uh, Arnold, who um, is going to introduce the speaker today. All right. Uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to have uh, Ram Lantheram here uh, to uh, present today's seminar. Uh, Ram is the uh, Joe C. Walter Chair in Engineering, and he's the director of the Texas Materials Institute um, and the Material Science and Engineering Graduate Program at University of Texas. Um, he's been there for a number of years, and he's gone through the ranks starting as an assistant professor all the way up through uh, the distinguished uh, chair position that he holds there. Um, he's an incredibly accomplished uh, scientist in the field. It's really an honor to have him here. Uh, he's a fellow of a number of uh, uh, professional societies, including uh, the Electrochemical Society, the Academy of Materials and Manufacturing Engineering, uh, as well as the American uh, Ceramic Society um, for a number of years. Um, his distinguished career includes uh, over 500 publications, uh, 400 journal articles, uh, a number of patents and things like that. Um, for me personally, I've been uh, seeing his work throughout my career, uh, particularly some of the novel work that he's done on developing new materials and really understanding um, the structure, the processing, and the performance um, in, in many types of novel chemistries, um, novel material systems. And uh, today it's a pleasure to hear him talk about some of the challenges and opportunities as we try to implement these systems in various types of uh, large uh, uh, large-scale uh, energy storage applications. Um, so without any further ado, Ram, please, thank you so much for visiting us, and we look forward to enjoying the talk. Thank you. Be before we start, I just want to point out we're being videotaped, and so as a result, it would be very helpful if you would turn off your cell phones at this time, and also be prepared to wait for a microphone at the end uh, to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Emily and Greg. I'm honored to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet uh, some of your faculty. I learned a lot. So with that, my talk is going to be focused on challenges and opportunities of electrical energy storage. Particularly in that, I'm going to talk about batteries. So in that, I'm going to talk about mainly materials challenges, because you need the right materials to build whatever you want to build. That does not minimize engineering. Once you have the right material, you have to have the engineering right to have the device going. So our re I'm a faculty member at UT. We do not have a material science and engineering department, but we do have a graduate program. So everybody in the material science and engineering program should be affiliated to a department. So I'm affiliated to the Department of Mechanical Engineering, even though my degree is in chemistry. So I'm not a hardcore <laughs> mechanical engineer, so don't ask me hardcore <laughs> mechanical <laughs> thermal fluid questions. OK, I'm also, a, all, also on the Graduate Studies Committee of the Chemical uh, Department of Chemical Engineering. So I can take graduate students through the Material Science Program, Department of Mechanical Engineering, as well as Chemical Engineering. So our research is focused on a lot of different uh, federal agencies, DuPont, and other, other companies. So to warm you up, I will go through a couple of slides to indicate the importance of energy. As you know, it's a very central issue impacting our way of life, economy, national security, environment, public health, everything is connected. And this shows the global energy outlook. Right now, we are 400-something quadrillion BTU. That number is expected to triple by the year 2100 based on moderate economic and population growth. Therefore, energy will be one of the greatest challenges facing us in the 21st century. Clearly, development of alternative, sustainable, clean energy technologies will be necessary to overcome this problem. 
So that's global. This is US. So there is a gap between the energy we produce here and the energy we consume, and that's growing. Uh, that's not good. And also, you will notice nearly one third of the total energy is consumed here. And then if you look at this chart here in the US, nearly 30% of the energy is by the transportation sector. And for automobiles or transportation, there are not too many options. You can't use directly solar, wind, or anything. There are only very limited options. And that is probably uh, batteries or capacitors, or I would say maybe fuel cells, if you solve all the problems. And then batteries are also major, sorry, uh, transportation is also a major source of pollution in particularly large cities like New York or San Francisco. So this you all know, we produce more and more carbon dioxide, that keeps us warmer and warmer. It's okay to be warm in the winter, but <laughs> you can't have too much uh, temperature increase. So right now, this is what we have. Still it is dominated by fossil fuel. And it is expected to be that way unless big breakthroughs happen uh, in terms of cost and other issues to use the other uh, alternate technologies. So there are several solutions, uh, solar, wind, nuclear, hydro, geothermal, fuel cells, batteries, and supercapacitors, and so on. Among them, the last three are collectively called as electrochemical energy conversion and storage technologies because they all rely on a common electrochemical principle. Fuel cell is an electrochemical energy conversion device. The other two are energy storage devices. They all have a, a negative anode, a, a positive a cathode. In between, you have an electrolyte, which should allow charge transfer only in the form of ion, should not allow any electron to go through. The electron should always go through the external circuit, so that principle is common. All these are applicable for different applications, portable, cell phone, laptop, transportation, as well as stationary storage. But the main challenge is high cost, safety issues, durability, or how long I can use my battery before I have to replace it. In the case of fuel cell, operability issues. So all these issues are hampering the commercialization of these technologies. And that is clearly linked to severe material challenges. And that's where my talk is focused. So with that, my group is involved heavily in different uh, things. But I would say about 60% or 2 thirds is mainly on rechargeable batteries. We are looking at lithium ion, sodium ion, dual electrolyte next generation batteries. So we are looking at fixing the problems with some of the existing chemistries, battery chemistries as well as looking at newer uh, next generation chemistries. I also do some work on uh, fuel cells, uh, little bit on solar cells. So even though it looks like a lot of different things, we do all the way from designing materials based on basic chemistry and physics. My degrees are all in chemistry. So that's all, that's the only thing I know. <laughs> so we try to use it to do good engineering. We do a lot of chemical synthesis. Hopefully you will see that in my talk as we go along. We do a lot of different characterizations uh, to understand what we made. In each one of them, we try to make the prototype device. If it is a battery, we make the battery. If it is a fuel cell, we make the fuel, fuel cell, single cell. And then we try to understand their performance so that the students can have a good fundamental understanding of the structure, property, performance, or structure, composition, property, performance, relationship so that they can have good science and different to their committee. I don't trumpet myself as a big nano guy, but everything we do here, nano is involved. We work with nanometal alloys, oxides, carbon, and nanocomposites. My core area is transition metal oxides. So that's where my core is. A lot of work is done. So different things we do just comes out of that. Applications are different, but the basic material, science and engineering, is mainly a lot of things on oxides. Now to batteries. Everybody is after lithium ion batteries because they give you much higher energy density than any of these other rechargeable systems because of only one thing. Lithium ion batteries use non aqueous water free electrolyte, therefore, you can get at least 4 volt per cell. All others use water based electrolyte, therefore, they are limited in voltage, approximately less than 2 volt. 
the energy density is a product of the cell voltage times how much charge you can store. That is called capacity. So voltage is doubled, so automatically we will have higher energy uh, density. Why voltage is doubled? In the case of water, electrolyte, the separation between highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital is small. And for the battery to operate, your anode and the cathode energies, if you talk to physicists, you can say Fermi energy. If you talk to electrochemists, you can say redox energy. They have to lie within that band gap. Because water has a smaller band gap, the distance or the separation between these two is limited. So you can't have more than 2 volt. If you try to do more than that, then you'll be doing unwanted oxidation or reduction on the electrolyte. That means electrolyte will be transferring electron. That's not good. Electrolyte should allow charge transfer only in the form of ions, not in the form of electrons. So that's what is limiting. When you go to lithium ion battery, usually in the commercial cell, this is what you use, lithium hexafluorophosphate in some organic solvents like ethylene carbonate and diethyl carbonate or dimethyl carbonate, some mixed solvents to optimize the viscosity as well as the lithium ion conductivity. So those who have much wider window, so you can keep this as high as possible, keep this as low as possible, so you increase the separation, so you get higher voltage, that's 4 volt. We do have materials up to 5 volt, but these electrolytes are not good right now with that kind of 5 volt materials. So if you want to make money, or one of the challenges in the field is come up with a new electrolyte that will have the window even larger than what we have now. Then you can increase the energy density more than what we have right now. So that's not the only thing. So you have to keep the voltage as much as possible without damaging the electrolyte. I should be able to store a lot of charge in these two anode and cathode materials to have the energy density. So right now, the technology is based on insertion compound electrodes. Graphite, you can store one lithium out of six carbon. That's the maximum it can store. With lithium cobalt dioxide, you can store one lithium per cobalt, but in the practical battery, you can use only half of that. If you use more than that, you will have Boeing fire, <laughs> you have Dell recall, that kind of problem. So you are, we are not even able to use the full capacity of this material because of the problems. So that's for the energy density. It doesn't stop there. You want to have fast charge, fast discharge. If it is cell phone, laptop, slow, low power devices, I do not have to charge it in five minutes. It's slowly charging, that's okay. But if, you, if it is transportation or even grid storage, then you need fast charge, fast discharge. That depends upon two things. These materials should have fast lithium ion conduction, lithium ion diffusion from one lattice site to another lattice site. They should also have fast electronic conduction, both of them. If not, you will try to do some extrinsic stuff that will raise the cost. So that's, that's the second. Third, to have fast charge discharge rate, electronic and ionic conductivity is important. Third, when you do this, the material should maintain these kind of layered structures intact for thousands of cycles. Supposing if it is collapsing or this guy, cobalt, migrating from that to here, when you create a lot of vacancies here, that will decrease the amount of material which can store the charge, so capacity will fade over time. So that's, you have to have good reversibility. Cell phone, laptop, lot of companies give you free phone, you sign a two-year contract, so I don't care, but my car battery will be $15,000 or something. I can't just throw away in two years and try to buy another battery. I'm not buying that car. Grid storage, even more. Big battery. I don't know how many dollars it will be. Much more money, so we can't replace it every two years. We have to replace it 20 years, 15 years, like that. So that's the issue. So your material should be very, very stable. Finally, Actually, that is the most important factor, cost for transportation as well as stationary storage. All the raw materials I use as well as fabrication or uh, processing cost has to be low to be cost competitive. Finally, we don't want to fight with the EPA, so the materials have to be environmentally benign. So it's getting complicated. So 
everything is controlled by what kind of material you have to as a starting point and several criteria have to be satisfied that's why nobody has that magic material which will do everything that's why it is good for us to get funding and do a lot of research <laughs> yes sure yeah, I, I think, no, 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 not again. I'm sorry, I should delete one of these. So what all it says is, during charge, the electron will go from here to there. During discharge, it will go in the opposite direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Charging and discharging is drawn in the same diagram. That's sorry, that's what is confusing. So <laughs> I should delete one of them. Yes, good. The electrical engineer, so you have to ask the questions. Electron cannot jump <laughs> like that. <laughs> okay. So this is the op sorry. This is the operation as you see here when things are moving back and forth. Charging it goes in one direction, discharge it goes in the other direction. Then you get the voltage profile. So basically, the free energy change. You have stored electricity in the form of chemical energy, and the free energy change during that reaction is taken out as electricity. Of course, particular that equation. So you are all wanting to know that. Preliminary introduction, you want to know where the field is, so this slide is very important. So right now, we use the negative electrode as graphite, whose operating voltage is, this scale is versus lithium. So lithium is zero. So this is very close to lithium. And then in laptop, cell phone, you use a material lithium cobalt oxide or solid solutions containing cobalt, manganese, nickel here instead of just cobalt alone. That has this layered structure, two-dimensional. That is basically sodium chloride structure if you love material science. But the charge difference between Li plus and CO3 plus is large, and also they have large size difference. Therefore, the cobalt 3 plus and the lithium plus, they tend to order along the alternate triple one planes of the sodium chloride structure, so it becomes a layered structure. So it's a simple sodium chloride. So lithium can go in and out uh, easily, that's why that is a very good material. That was the material used in 1991 when Sony first commercialized the lithium ion cells. So that's what mostly used in cell phone and laptop computers. Spinel, LiMn2O4, has a three-dimensional structure. So it has three-dimensional lithium ion diffusion. Both of them have edge shared octahedra. So the metal ions can directly see each other. Therefore, there is a good hopping conduction. In the case of lithium cobalt dioxide, actually it is metallic, so electronic conductivity is not a problem. In the case of spinel, good hopping conduction because edge shared octahedra, the metal can transfer electron. So that's a fairly good hopping semiconductor. So conductivity is not an issue. But that has a very basic chemistry problem. Mn3 plus, if you have in presence of very trace amount of acid, two Mn3 plus will come close to each other. One will become Mn2 plus, one will become Mn4 plus, Mn2 plus is soluble, Mn4 plus is stable in acid. So that's called disproportionation. And that is what is killing this material. So that's why it was not used for so long. Now they barely make it by having that material and mixing with some layered oxides. That's what you have in Chevy Volt or Nissan Leaf. The spinel predominantly about two third, one third, some layered oxide so that the protons, parts per million, coming from the electrolyte can be trapped into these layers here, I think. Industry doesn't know that much. We have done a lot of work. I think the proton can be trapped here. Therefore, that uh, dissolution or uh, disproportionation is suppressed. There is another material, LiFePO4, that has this structure. These two operate on 3 plus 4 plus coupled. So the charge transfer gap between the top of oxygen 2p, I think I have a slide here, and the oxygen 2p and the metal here, actually it is overlapping. That has consequences. It's a very small, so highly covalent system. So that has good electronic electron transfer. In the case of iron, you deal with Fe2 plus 3 plus coupled as opposed to Fe3 plus 4 plus coupled. So iron is somewhere here, so there is a big charge transfer gap between the metal 3D level and the oxygen 2P. So it is more localized system, less delocalized, less covalent, so more localized. So that means lousy electronic conductor, this material. It is also a one-dimensional lithium ion conductor. This is two-dimensional, this is three-dimensional, 
This is one dimensional. So supposing if there is a cross substitution, small amount of ion in lithium site, that one dimensional channel will be blocked, lithium cannot move. So a lousy lithium ion conductor. So what we should do, even though among all of these, iron is the cheapest and most environmentally benign, manganese is good too. Because to overcome this problem, what we need to do, I have to make this small nanoparticle and then I have to coat it with the carbon uniformly. So processing cost goes up and also you have to make it consistently the same kind of material, quality control. So the cost of LiFePO4 is much more than LiMN2O4. LiMN2 so cost is a big issue. So raw material may be cheap, but your process has to be less expensive to be cost competitive. So that material also has lower energy, energy I mean lower density, crystallographic density, and on top of it, to make it nano, you coat with carbon. So volumetric energy density really goes down, not good for automobiles. And all these three, these are the only three right now available. And all the three were originally identified by somebody called Professor John B. Goodenough. And I had the fortune of going to him as a postdoc when he was in Oxford. That's where I met with him. So we both of us came together to UT Austin in 1986, and ever since I've stayed there. He is 90, 91 years old. He has not retired yet. This is his last semester, he says. He's still active. He's still doing research. So he's the one who developed all these materials. And he got the National Medal of Science, as you know, uh, two months back uh, this year. And he also is also a member of, he became National Academy, Academy of Engineering in 1976, just before going to Oxford. He was at MIT Lincoln Lab for so many years, and he went to Oxford 10 years, then he came back. And he became National Academy of Science member this year also. It should have happened probably 20, 30 years back, but it happened, <laughs> happened later. Anyway, so that's what is the technologies right now. Each one of them have advantages and disadvantages. As you see here, graphite has low potential. Therefore, it can help to maximize the cell voltage. Here, cobalt oxide is good for reversibility, but I can't use more than 50% because, as you see here, this band overlaps with the top of the oxygen 2P. So if you remove, extract, charge more than 50%, you not only oxidize or remove electron from the metal 3D band, you also remove electron from the oxygen 2P. If you remove too much, then O2 minus ions can be oxidized to O, and then O2, neutral oxygen, reacting with the electrolyte, explosion, Boeing recall, Dell recall, all those are associated with this. Now, that does not start in the beginning. The real killer is this guy, carbon. Because the voltage is very close to this, when you do fast charge, or when you are uh, in the winter right here, or even up, when you assemble the battery, this surface reacts with that organic electrolyte to form a surface film called solid electrolyte interface layer. And that is not a good lithium ion conductor. When you charge, try to charge fast, if the lithium ion cannot go through that interface, lithium will plate on the surface. When it plates, it doesn't plate smoothly like that. It plates like dendrite. When the dendrite is forming, you have a soft polymeric separator. That separates the two electrodes. It will make a hole, short. All the currents flows internally. That's the end of it. And when the current flows internally, the cobalt oxide, because of this problem, will lose oxygen much more easily. So you have shorting, temperature goes up, this guy loses oxygen, lithium cobalt oxide. Then you have all the organic liquid electrolyte present there, big fire, problem. That's what all the safety happens, safety issues happen. What should we do? Throw this guy out. Find out something which will operate a little bit higher voltage, therefore you will have better safety. So there is a lot of work going on with the silicon, for example. Silicon is not going to solve that problem. Everybody, a lot of people, a lot of startup, a lot of people working on silicon because silicon has charge storage capacity of 4,000 amp power per kilogram as opposed to 372 amp power per kilogram here, an order of magnitude higher. So everybody is marching on that, but silicon operating voltage is around 0.3, so that's not completely going to solve the problem. I have some other material, antimony, 
around 0.5 to 0.8, little better. So that's what we work. We are not working on silicon. I don't say anything bad about it, but from a safety point of view, silicon might not be the one which is going to solve the problem. So there's a lot of action over here, particularly on silicon, to couple with this. There are also two other cathode materials. This is another spinel where nickel is the active redox coupled. So you get 4.7 volt as opposed to 4 volt, but that has electrolyte stability problem. We do a lot of work on that to overcome or make it work. There is another layered oxide. It's called lithium rich layered oxide, uh, patented by Argonne National Lab that has been licensed by GM, Toda America, BASF, uh, and few others. Uh, Envia, uh, LG Chem in Korea, there are lots of challenges. So we try to do some lot of basic work we under, to understand and fix it, and same here. I think I may not be able to go through each one of those, uh, but anyway, that's where we work on, that's where we work on. You look at here, all these materials have capacity in terms of hundreds, less than 300, or practically right now less than 200 milliamp hour per gram. Sulfur has 16, 75 milliampere per gram. Oxygen has double of that if you get lithium oxide Li2O, four electron transfer for uh, each uh, oxygen molecule. So it's a huge amount of energy or charge you can store here. But there are a lot of, lot of challenges with this. So we do work on this as well. So I will not be able to talk about everything. But at least if you want to know where the field is going right now, all the technology we have are one of these cathode and graphite anode. There is no other choice for anode right now. The future is silicon, for example, here, or other alloy anodes, tin or antimony here, and then use that cathode or use this cathode or use that cathode or use this cathode. That's where the action is. Or some up, some, somebody else may come up with another cathode. So all these are to increase the energy density and abundance cost. Now, this is based on lithium chemistry. There is also a lot of interest to go from other chemistries. Why lithium? Why not sodium? Because lithium is uh, not too much lithium in the US. And unfortunately, lithium is located in some places who are not friendly to us, who can blackmail us. I don't want to say who they are. <laughs> so. Because of that, government and others are worried, why should we have lithium ion? Can we have some other technology? Sodium ion, sodium is available plenty, abundant, cheaper. So there is another uh, technology, sodium ion. Not much work has been done. That's a whole new area people can do. And it is not a simple re replacement of lithium by sodium in this. No, you have to develop the whole new set of cathodes and anodes. And we are working some of those aspects as well. Then there is this magnesium ion battery, aluminum ion battery. Magnesium ion, you see, it has two plus charge. So if you store one magnesium instead of one lithium, you store two charges instead of one charge. If you store aluminum instead of lithium, you store three charges instead of one charge. So there is a lot of interest to work on those. But let me tell you this. Lithium is lightest, one plus charge goes and bonds with the oxygen because the electrostatic bond strength depends upon the charge. So you bond a three plus ion with something else, more uh, charge, so that bond will be very strong. Yes, aluminum can go and bond there. How is it going to come out easily? It has to be reversible. So it is going to be a huge, huge challenge. And I'm not sure you will see aluminum ion battery or magnesium ion battery much more readily than lithium ion. So right now, if you ask me, there is nothing to beat lithium ion. Sodium ion cannot give you more energy density than lithium ion. I am very sure about it. But it will give you a lot of cost advantage. It will give you a lot of uh, abundance. Uh, it will also give us a lot of peace, not to be worried about blackmailing, right? <laughs> we can have plenty of sodium. So I'm kind of telling you where the field is going. Yes. Yeah, so that's more liquid electrolyte base. That the one I'm talking about here is I'm talking about all the way from my cell phone application to transportation to grid storage. Okay, there are some batteries like that. I know they have a project, RPI project they're working on. Good, 
That is mainly for stationary storage. So I'm having all the three. Like I said, stationary storage is not the only end of it. You have to also find ways for transportation. That's about one third of the energy. So for that, that will not work for probably transportation. That's for stationary. So the type of battery you are considering also depends upon the application. For stationary storage, the criteria changes. For portable device, energy is the main, main issue. How much is energy I can store so that I can use my cell phone battery for a longer time, right? Or my laptop longer time. I don't care about cost because it's small battery. For transportation, cost is an issue. Psych life is an issue. Of course, energy, is also, energy density is also an issue. But order changes. For stationary storage, cost and cycle life. I don't care too much about energy. Although energy is also cost. If more energy means less number of cells, less cost. But I have a lot of land. I can keep that battery, right, for stationary storage. So the criteria changes. So different batteries will be for different applications. Yes. The right part. The right side. Okay. The, I know what you are asking. Yeah. If it is here, that is forming lithium peroxide, Li2O2. Yeah. If it is here, it is forming Li2O. So, Li2 so, oh, oh, so oh, here. Minus. That's the maximum. Two, two electrons per oxygen. Per oxygen atom. Yeah. If it is here, four electrons per oxygen molecule. If it is here, two electrons per oxygen molecule. Yeah. And when you do non aqueous, most lithium peroxide may be formed. So that's why I put a wide line. Depends upon non-aqueous or aqueous, it can be that way. That's why I draw like that. OK? OK. So safety-wise, cobalt is the worst actor. If you go to nickel, for example, it has one more electron. So instead of, I think this is a lot of chemistry I have to teach <laughs> or I have to explain. Uh, crystal field uh, splitting, I'm not going to do that. So. This is a little bit above, so safety-wise is better. Manganese is really, really the best one because manganese redox active band is well above the top of oxygen 2P. But why not? Why don't we use this? Why are we using this? A lot of other issues. When you charge it, it will transform from the layered structure to this phenyl structure. So that's the problem. Why it, why it transforms? The transition metal ion can easily migrate from an octahedral site to a tetrahedral site to this octahedral site because less octahedral site stabilization energy for manganese. Cobalt has six electron in the low-lying T2G. Strong octahedral site preference. It hates tetrahedral site, so it will not migrate. So it's all basic chemistry. So you know, chemistry and physics has a large role to play here to design what you need to do. On top of it, you have to have all engineering good, otherwise nothing will work. We do a lot of chemical synthesis, so for example, microwave assisted hydrothermal, salothermal, LiFePO4, I mentioned to you, that has to be made nano, coated with carbon, so we can make much more uniform or controlled nano size materials, highly crystalline, no hydrogen involved, just less than 300 in 5 10 minutes we can cook it. So, synthesis is very important. Now, this is my list, and I don't think I can go through everything, so let me see. Uh, Tell you first lithium rich layer. This is a material patented by Argon and licensed to a lot of different companies I mentioned. Right now, the technology is based on approximately 150 or 160 milliamp hour per gram, less than 200 milliamp hour per gram. That's all we have right now. This material, 250 to 300 milliamp hour per gram. That's why everybody is interested, and a lot of people have licensed this material. And also, it has a lot of manganese and a little bit of nickel, small amount of cobalt, so cost is low. It also has better safety, like I pointed out earlier. You see, these have better safety than cobalt oxide. But it has few problems. You have to charge it to 4.7 or 4.8 volt. That's a problem. The electrolyte can become a little bit unstable. And it also loses oxygen from the lattice in the first cycle. So already, the material surface is reacting with the electrolyte. And if it loses oxygen, you have a lot of oxygen defects, high surface energy. So the electrolyte reaction will be aggravated. So that's a problem. Surface has to be conditioned. And then the material rearranges after losing oxygen, having oxygen vacancies and rearranging. So that causes difference between charge capacity and discharge capacity. Meaning, 
I pulled out a lot of lithium, but when I discharge it, when I use it, I can't put all of them in. So that's the problem. It cannot be charged, discharged fast. So we have done some work. What all we did is make the material, then chemically coat with aluminum oxide or aluminum phosphate. When you do that, you see the red ones are after coating, the black ones are before coating. The difference is decreased between charge and discharge. So that means we decrease the irreversible capacity loss in the first cycle. And that helps to have higher discharge capacity, as you see here. Red ones are after coating, the black ones are before coating. That's because when you oxygen is evolved, lot of oxygen vacancies. So when you surface coat, you tend to keep the material towards this rather than towards this rearrangement. So we can do a little calculation. We find when we surface modify, we tend to keep more this way. So this difference is decreased. So just by chemical conditioning of the surface, you are able to overcome some other problem. On top of it, the surface is very reactive because transition metal ions can oxidize the electrolyte. So if you coat with aluminum phosphate or aluminum oxide, that's much more inert. So the rate capability goes up. The, it's, it's a surprise. I did not believe when my students first did the work. What? You are coating an insulated aluminum oxide, coating with an insulating aluminum phosphate, how come the rate capability goes up? That's because when you coat with aluminum oxide or aluminum phosphate, you suppress this aggressive reaction of the transition metal ions and the cathode with the electrolyte. Basically, you decrease the SA layer formation at higher voltage, so rate capability goes up. We have done some XPS. The black one is uncoated material. The red ones are red and uh, green are coated material. You do see less concentration of LIF. That means you have less thicker SEA layer. Instead of aluminum phosphate or aluminum oxide, we put ruthenium oxide because that's a good metallic conductor, should help. But as you know, ruthenium oxide is a good catalyst. So it oxidizes the, catalyzes the oxidation more. So that's worse than the bare material. So it's all, so conditioning the surface helps to decrease the irreversible capacity loss. It also helps to increase the rate capability because you are suppressing the solid electrolyte interface layer formation, and that's reflected in the impedance, less impedance the coated material has. I think I can skip it. Spinel. As I pointed out, this is the best material, spinel, because three-dimensional lithium ion diffusion, but manganese dissolution is a problem. So this has a lot of uh, advantages. I don't, I think I have already explained a lot of these here. So this material operates with nickel 2 plus to 3 plus to 3 plus to 4 plus couple. That has slightly higher voltage. The issues are when you form it, you get nickel oxide impurity. Not all the nickel is in the lattice. And it also tends to order in the spinel lattice because manganese 4 plus, nickel 2 plus, big charge difference and big size difference. So they tend to order. When they order, electronic conductivity goes down. So that's one issue. Because of that, the material performance varies a lot depending upon who made it in my lab and how it was made. And there is no understanding. Ah, oh, yeah, that guy reported we are not getting there must be false. Actually, everybody's right. By chance, they got the right to synthesis or processing. So we do understand what are all the factors influencing. So first we find, if you have exactly this, you have nickel oxide impurity. If you anneal at 700 degrees C, nickel oxide impurity is gone. That means nickel solubility in the crystal lattice is temperature dependent. It increases as you go down. Interestingly, you put small amount of any one of these dopant ion, even at high temperature, no nickel oxide impurity. And no ordering. Doping with small amount eliminates the ordering between manganese 4 plus and nickel 2 plus. It also eliminates the impurity. Everybody who sells the battery, they have to demonstrate the performance at high temperature, 55 degrees C, because I'm in Texas. I go out in the summer to my car. It's already like a furnace. So if they cannot demonstrate, they cannot sell the battery. So if you do at room temperature, you can't find the difference much. But if you do at elevated temperature, this is the undoped. This is doped with any one of these. You have better performance. Also, the doped material has better rate capability than the undoped material. So doping helps 
because of few things because of suppressing the order eliminating the impurity more importantly we have done a lot of xps as well as time of flight secondary and mass spectroscopy this is an unexplored underexplored area in the battery community when you dope with these things turns out certain ions preferentially segregate to the surface i was talking about it earlier so when these ions are on the surface some of them are much more friendlier with the electrolyte they don't react that much with the electrolyte so you have a better more stable robust electrode electrolyte interface so that helps a lot so this is one step synthesis you are not coating externally during synthesis certain things segregate by themselves to the surface and surface is enriched with certain more friendly ion that's why they show better performance i think that's also reflected in the impedance we do lot of chemical synthesis now lots of time you will see reports in the literature high performance but it may be very porous may be very nano it's not useful here if it is very porous very nano i can't pack it my car will need more space to put my battery so the battery industry will call it as tap density how well your material is packed so for example when you have these kind of particles you may have much more high tap density as opposed to smaller particles so synthesizing the material with optimum particle size so you have high packing density is very important for cell phone laptop as well as for automobile not for stationary storage not for grid storage and we also find when you have crystals like perfect octahedral like this triple one planes on the surface they perform much more better than crystals in which you have truncated 100 plane and then lot of one triple one plane so surface morphology surface plane is very critical for how the lithium transfer or the manganese dissolution metal dissolution occur in these materials so everything so it's not only you identify the specific material you have to also make them in such a way so that you have the right surface so that they do not react too much or they do not uh, dissolve lot of metal into solution okay so so far we talked about two cathode systems i talked about actually this is the challenge biggest challenge all the safety comes from graphite because voltage is close to that of carbon so my question is can safer anodes be developed i think it is yes there are alloys antimony 660 capacity silicon 4000 capacity that's why everybody lots of people work on this and tin 990 a lot of work done in the past too so right now the cathode capacity is less than 200 milliamp hour per gram what am i going to do with 4000 milliamp hour per gram one electrode will be 1 mm thick another electrode will be 1 micron thick i mean not 1 micron maybe 10 micron <laughs> so it's not what is it so right now with the cathode capacity we have anything above 700 d 700 milliamp hour per gram anode capacity is not going to be going to make any big difference but these materials for example have huge tap density graphite tap density less than 1 gram per centimeter cube silicon even less because they have to make it very porous very nano with a lot of space to accommodate 400% volume change silicon sorry antimony has only 140% volume change now what is the advantage here antimony this is pure antimony voltage around 0.8 so lithium will not be plated i can charge the charge fast without plating lithium the sodium plating is much more than lithium plating because sodium voltage is even closer so sodium plating can be avoided lithium plating can be avoided with this kind of anode the problem is big volume change so what do we do we make an anode composite consisting of this active and other things like aluminum oxide or we can make a whole range of materials like indicated here carbon aluminum oxide matrix in which antimony is for example antimony or cutsb or nickel sb or iron sb2 is dispersed how do we do very simple process you take antimony oxide aluminum metal plus carbon ball mill the free energy change for that reaction is negative so room temperature ball mill antimony oxide is reduced to antimony aluminum grabs the oxygen becomes aluminum oxide so you start with this no heating nothing room temperature ball milling you get what you need antimony dispersed in a matrix matrix of 
aluminum, oxide and carbon, then you get all these cyclabilities, look at the rate capability. 1C means you get the whole capacity in one hour. 5C means you get the whole capacity in one hour, five hours. 0.5C means you get the whole capacity in two hours. So this is fast charge, doesn't change much. High rate capability systems. But I lose one thing. Our operating voltage is higher, therefore I will lose some energy. But tap density is high, yes. So how much do you sacrifice the specific capacity by adding the extra matrix to it? No, the capacity I'm giving you here, people will cheat. I'm not cheating here. <laughs> the capacity I'm putting it here for the whole thing, not antimony. That's for the whole composite. So that's my electrode. I'm considering my aluminum oxide carbon as active material. So, but tap density two times or one and a half times more than graphite. So volumetric energy density will be huge. Right now, this has been licensed by a startup and they have a NIST contract and they are working on manufacturing it. Uh, fortunately, not a lot of people pay <laughs> working on that. So you can coolly do a lot of different things <laughs> with that thing. Okay, so we are working with a lot of different alloy combinations and we have a big DOE project, basic science. So we can do a lot of basic science understanding. I think I'll uh, skip this. Uh, let's see. We are also looking at for sodium ion. For sodium ion, you cannot use graphite. The only anode you can use is hard carbon. With the hard carbon, SA layer will form, so sodium will plate. The plating of sodium is much more than lithium, therefore safety is a big issue. So that's why these anodes we think they may have much more appealing, will be much more appealing in the case of sodium ion batteries because voltage is higher. Very beginning, we begin to see a lot of interesting things, much more optimization needs to be done. And another thing you find is during cycling, usual problem is these particles will come close to each other, grow, they become bigger. When they become bigger, volume expansion will be magnified, so the electrode will crack and they will fail. Here, as you see, it doesn't change too much. Yes? Do you, do you see anything on the horizon for a proper insertion electrode you know, for sodium and aqueous electrolytes rather than... Yes. You, yeah, yeah, there are possibilities. Uh, that will be much more cheaper. Your voltage will be less, like the Russian blue, for example. Right. right? Anode, anode is totally a different... Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, I have not seen... Okay. For non, even for non-aqueous, other than hard carbon, there is nothing else available. For aqueous, that's a totally a different story. It is not there. So more work needs to be done. Sodium is fairly new, right? Not a lot of work has been done. Because of cost advantages, there is a lot of attention being paid to, to sodium. Now, this is really next generation. There are two things for next generation, or three things. Sodium ion, I kind of mentioned. Uh, sodium, lithium sulfur, as well as lithium air. So sulfur exists as SC8, as you know. It does not exist as simply S. This is how the molecule is. So when you insert lithium, the bonds break in steps. They don't, don't, they don't all break at one step to give from S8 to Li2S. It doesn't happen that way. You have Li2S8, Li2S6, Li2S4, Li2S6, Li2S. And these are called polysulfides. And they are soluble in the electrolyte. And also both sulfur and Li2S are electrical insulators, 10 to the power 15. Lithium chloride will be much more insulating than this. So these poly, so two problems, insulating, so you have to have some conductive, conductive agents. These dissolve, so when they dissolve, they migrate from here to there, so that causes coulombic efficiency problem because you are losing the active material. It also goes and then deposits on the surface and that gives you bad lithium anode performance. So all these problems. So we have been following few strategies. One is have a multi-wall carbon nanotube, disperse in sodium thiosulfate, then you add hydrochloric acid, that's a high school reaction. You will generate sulfur in the multi-wall carbon nanotube. We can actually peel it off. No binder, no NMP solvent, N-methyl pyrrolidone, toxic solvent involved. It's highly uh, conductive. So you may be able to use even a current collector without a current collector. So that's a lot of advantages. And that's the performance. 
Even at high rate, you can get high capacity. Remember, I was talking about others, they are all less than 200. Here, you can have thousands capacity and also fairly good rate capability. Another, I can skip this. Another aspect, we have the electrode, sulfur, without any multi-wall carbon nanotube. Then we make a carbon paper, multi-wall carbon nanotube or Torre carbon paper. We put that in between the cathode and the separator. So any polysulfide comes out is trapped by those carbon paper. So that's what that is. And that is published here, uh, end of last year. So you can look at it. So we are adopting different strategies to overcome some of these problems. Now that's the cyclability of that particular system. You see a lot of data in the literature on the lithium sulfur system. Usually it will be rate C over 20. That means you are charging for 20 hours slow. Or C over 10, that's 10 hours. You see here 2C, that means 30 minutes. 1C, 1 hour. Charging rate is important for transportation as well as stationary storage. So high rate data is very critical. This is another system. I think just came uh, uh, Torre because carbon, multi wall carbon nanotube is more expensive. So, this is a regular paper. So, we can do some treatment, put in between. So, try to trap and suppress the migration. We are also doing another strategy. It's not pub published yet. So, we start with a multi wall carbon nanotube electrode, but we start with a liquid polysulfide that is soluble in tetrahydrofuran. You can even have 10 molar solution. You start with that you can get even much higher capacity, 15 or 1600 milliamp hour per gram. So a lot of different things possible with sulfur. So you want to know what is the future. If you honestly ask me, if you want to have a significant increase in energy density, the next thing may be sulfur. And I'm confident during the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, if something happens, maybe this is the system which might work to significantly increase the energy density. Not like 10 percent, 5 percent. That you can do with the insertion compound I was talking about. This is the system probably which may give you something. This is the last system I want to talk about, lithium air. Probably a lot of hype. Uh, <laughs> this system is, those of you know about fuel cell, this is fuel cell plus some other problem. Fuel cell, you have to worry about only oxygen reduction and have that nice catalyst. Here, you have to worry about oxygen reduction and reversing the reaction that is called oxygen evolution. And both of them need good catalyst, otherwise you will have a big difference. So you lose energy between charge and discharge. That's one problem. The other problem is, you have a non-aqueous electrolyte. I want to get oxygen free from the atmosphere. That's why hype is coming. And when the oxygen comes, a lot of humidity over here, it will carry a lot of water. And then carbon dioxide, and your electrolyte is that, the electrolyte will be degraded. And the catalyst I'm talking about should reduce only the oxygen and then oxidize the oxide ion. And when you have an organic electrolyte, that catalyst will degrade the electrolyte first before it does anything with the oxygen or oxide ion. Challenge. And then you form lithium peroxide, non aqueous electrolyte, not soluble. It goes and clogs all the air electrode pore, so oxygen cannot get in. What a mess. And it is very hard to solve all those problems. So, it may be impossible, but maybe somebody will be clever. They will have all those magic working. It may happen, but I'm just telling you because from what I talk to people, students, and faculty, I think, what is the future, where the field is going, that's why I'm trying to tell you my honest opinion. That does not mean I'm going to be 100%. You can never say nothing will happen, <laughs> right? Sometimes things will happen. Whatever I feel honestly right now, I'm telling you. So what we are doing, we are trying to do a dual electrolyte system. That means we have a ceramic separator. One side non-aqueous electrolyte with lithium. This side aqueous electrolyte with oxygen. So I do not have to worry about contamination from air because it's aqueous. I do not have to worry about clogging because it will form lithium hydroxide, soluble. But there is one huge challenge. My separator here, ceramic membrane, should allow only the lithium or sodium to go through. It should not allow my proton to go through. It has to be selective. And that is solid state chemistry and physics problem. You all want to know what John Goodenough is doing now. 
He is 91 years old. That's what he is working on for the past five, six years. And barely making it, not quite yet, but he wants to do something basic, want to make a difference. So if you have a good ceramic electrolyte, that can also suppress the dendrite formation because the dendrite formed in lithium cannot, or I won't say, hard to go through that ceramic electrolyte as opposed to going through the soft polymer membrane we have right now. So we are playing with that kind of system with phosphoric acid. So phosphoric acid can transfer three protons. So we wanted to do nice chemistry. That's a discharge profile. Uh, the phosphoric acid can also be a flow system. One side lithium not flowing. The other side cathode can be, be a flow through system. So we monitor the pH in situ. So we can see this, we can demonstrate the cell chemistry because when you consume phosphoric acid to lithium phosphate, pH should increase. And that's what you see here from this pH plot. And this is what I was talking about. The catalyst, this is a discharge voltage, that's a charge voltage, there is a gap. That is not good. We do not have the magic catalyst which will have lower over potential during oxygen reduction and lower over potential during oxygen evolution. So somebody has to develop a good catalyst. So you know, it's in my opinion, this is, we all know fuel cell is, has a lot of problems. This has additional problems. So I teach a class this semester, it's called electrochemical energy materials, materials for batteries and fuel cells. This is what I tell them first. Fuel cell, I'm, no offense, nothing. I'm working on both. I'm funded on both. Fuel cells have 200 problems to solve. Batteries have 20 problems to solve, so you figure out. But it depends on which battery you are talking about. <laughs> so that's the conclusion. We all know the wireless revolution. Lithium-ion batteries have enabled that along with the electronics. But uh, we are looking at transportation and stationary storage, grid storage. Cost, life, safety, energy, environmental, all those are issues. So the material changes. We can't use the same material we are using in the cell phone because of all these criteria. We talked about few things here. Overall, the electrode surface electrolyte interaction is a big problem. I was talking this morning. Surface chemistry is a big issue here. What is on that one layer on that surface? Do I have good technique to understand it? Once I understand it, can I go back to the lab and make it? Then we are in business. Because high voltage cathode we can't use because of the reaction of the surface with the electrolyte. So we need to understand and we have, we have to have the right surface. And planes matter. What is on the surface matter. So surface structure, surface composition, and surface planes, all those matter. And if you want to do new research, if there are organic chemists here, you have a good chance if you come up with an electrolyte with a big Separation between LUMO and HOMO. That's a good area to work. But there are a lot of people working. It's not quite there yet. So we talked about a few things here. Lithium sulfur, I think as I pointed out, that may be the next one. If at all it happens, with a significant increase. And then lithium air, too many challenges. So we are slightly upper, working on different uh, category. I must say, I'm so grateful. A lot of wonderful students and the postdocs over the years. That made my life uh, easier. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here. So what all I mean is professors are busy. I used to go to the lab by myself. When I was an assistant professor, I would work with my students. I do all those. I can no longer do that because I have administrative responsibilities, handling too many people. So I was so fortunate that I have a lot of good people. I'm very grateful to them. If I do not have good students, I would have already dead. <laughs> I won't be alive. So then the funding agencies. Thank you. Maybe I took a little bit longer. So I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you for that if very can. and, and informative talk. And we'll open this up for uh, some questions. We have a few minutes. I think there's a microphone coming around. So You're brave. That's good. Okay, I heard uh, or I saw something recently about um, a company in Israel, Finergy, I think, that was working on a metal. Super ion. Uh, what's that? Is it super valent batteries or? It's a metal oxide or metal air batteries, and uh, they were using aluminum uh, plates, and supposedly they were claiming that they might be able to extend the range of 
uh, electric vehicles by like a thousand miles with 50 aluminum plates and they have I think some kind of silver catalyst. And I was curious if you had heard anything about that or... Let me understand it. So this is aluminum metal anode and then that side oxygen? Uh, I believe it uses oxygen, yeah, from the air. I'm not sure what the system is at all. I don't, they're not very clear about that. But I was curious if you had heard about it and what your feelings, I guess, towards metal air batteries in general, maybe zinc air um, uh, or aluminum air. I think we talked about the earlier today too. So metal air systems uh, have some advantages because oxygen you do not have to store. But again, the catalyst has to be much more efficient uh, to decrease the over voltage between the, the reduction and the evolution. And also, the anodes, lots of time, it could form dendrite. So one should understand it and suppress all those. So it may be more useful for stationary storage rather than uh, for transportation, in my opinion. I think for transportation, probably the kind of things uh, with solid, uh, store, solid electrodes already stored there may be a little bit more attractive compared to using the oxygen systems in the for the automobiles. So for stationary storage, there is an option. So let me tell you this. There are a lot of different battery chemistries. I can't tell which battery chemistry is going to be better than the other one. What all I can say is each one of them have their own advantages and disadvantages. And which system we use, which system will win, depend upon the application. So that's how it is going to be. So we cannot stop and just putting all our efforts on one system. Different systems can have different advantages, so it will change. So it will depend upon the application type. And a lot of uh, oxygen-based systems actually funded by R E 2 so. I wonder if you could comment briefly on the research directions for large band cap electrolytes. Oh, I'm not a polymer guy, as you know. Just comment. <laughs> if I know, I won't be standing here. I'll be <laughs> in my garage. It's very hard to me, to be honest with you, to have that kind of 4.5 volt difference or 5 volt difference between the LUMO and HOMO. LUMO and HOMO, it is going to be very hard. Uh, you said that before, but what is the direction? People are trying to work with uh, different um, organic uh, chemicals. And in my opinion, right now, it's a fact. Right now, nobody has anything which will survive more than 4.3 without problems. So, so I can't tell you which is good because there is nothing barely making here and there, but there are a lot of issues. Usually, the way they, will, they are trying to overcome the problem is this. You have your basic electrolyte, then you add some additives and that additive will form a film, mainly on the anode side. That's where a lot of work has been done, so that the, you have a more favorable, uh, friendlier film on the anode. Not a lot of work has been done on the cathode side yet. So I think they should do similar work, probably with additive or coming, with, coming up with uh, newer electrolytes. Would you care to speculate uh, where uh, the supercapacitor development is uh, today vis-a-vis -vis the uh, lithium-ion batteries? Okay, so capacitor has a lot of advantages, meaning capacitor can store, charge, discharge very fast because it's a lot of surface reaction. So that is the biggest advantage. You can quickly, for example, grid storage, there is a lot of variation, maybe capacitor is good. But the problem is, because it's more surface reaction, you cannot store too much energy. So energy density device will be much lower than the lithium ion batteries. Now, if you talk to some people, they will say, I mean, it is true to some extent. Batteries are approaching the capacitors, right? So battery charge rate is keep on going up depending upon how you do the engineering. So the area may be getting blurred, but if you talk about pure capacitor, pure battery, if you want to store more energy, I think batteries have much more energy density than uh, capacitors. Also, I mentioned cost. When I say cost, everything is cost. The amount of energy I store is cost, because if I store more energy, I have to make less number of cells. That's cost, right? Less quality control, all those. So cycle life is cost, right? So to answer the question, capacitor, again, will have some advantages. Uh, you may have a battery system which may store a lot of energy, but you may not be able to charge, discharge fast. So in a car, you may have a hybrid system where you have a capacitor, initially to have high power, once you are 
on, you may use the battery for energy. There are a lot of different things. That's why nobody knows how things are going to be. Probably it is possible that lead acid may be the best system for grid storage. Who knows what? Because very well established standard technologies, there are too many variables and uh, there is no reliability data on all these systems. So, so the difference between capacitor and battery is energy versus how fast you can charge. We're running a little bit long. We have maybe time for one last, maybe quick question before we adjourn to the uh, cheese and cracker reception. I believe it is wine and cheese. <laughs> one last short. Who is that? If not, oh. Okay, there is somebody there. Uh, this is a. I, I'm learning about batteries through this talk. So, my my question is the oxide coated. Uh, Electrodes. Uh, so, does the lithium diffuse through the oxide? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. This is a common question. Um, any of us, the battery people present, come. There are a few things. When you have these, these coatings are very poor, porous. They are not because you coat chemically, and then you anneal around 300 or 400 degrees. You don't anneal at high temperatures. So, when you have that, it's porous. Not only that, when you have aluminum oxide coating. The LiAlO2, LiAlO2, Li, lithium, aluminum oxide has the same structure as lithium cobalt oxide. So at the interface, you will have a solid solution between lithium cobalt oxide and lithium aluminum oxide. At the cathode surface and aluminum oxide, through which lithium can diffuse through. So first of all, it is porous. Lot of electrolyte can still go through that. And then... The chemical coating may not be very uniform. There will be maybe some open spaces through which it can go. But the fact is, it, it works fine. You saw the rate capability higher than uncoated. So then, then it comes a really wild question for me. If, I, if you just make an electrode, aluminum oxide, another electrode, with two electrodes different, and, and if the lithium can diffuse, just like a capacitor, uh, will it work? Or can you? I'm not understanding. Oh, may, maybe I'll ask this question during oh, okay, the session later. I'm not yep, completely thanks. understanding yeah, yeah, yeah. the question. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, let's thank uh, Professor Mantera once again for his wonderful presentation. Thank you.